Welcome back to Asian Art. In this lecture, we're going to talk about how after the collapse of the kingdom of Mataram in central Java, there was a migration to the east, and over several centuries, a number of kingdoms rose and fell until eventually the kingdom of Mojapayat emerged. And in this kingdom, a new flowering of culture occurred, a kind of coming together, and no longer were they importing culture from India. They began to explore their own ideas about Hinduism and Buddhism and, and begin to project those out across Southeast Asia. To begin with, let's look at two examples here. One on the right, the Ganesh from Blitar, East Java, and the other is a Ganesh from inside Prambanan. Notice how the one from Prambanan on the left is much more clearly derived from Hindu sources in India, whereas the one on the right from Blitar, East Java, we see some very interesting innovation taking place. Notice how much larger the head is, and the eye, and the hands. It looks like an infant child, this Ganesh, who is, has this massive, ornate crown on his head, and this sort of funny, outy belly button, with this big, pudgy belly. So he looks quite childlike, sort of emphasizing the idea of innocence and the early years of this child's growth, the idea of fertility and abundance. Below this statue, you see a series of skulls, indicating, of course, the idea of death and disillusion as sort of the fertile ground out of which this Ganesh has sprung. On the opposite side of the statue is something quite surprising. We find the head of Kala, now with his bulging eyes and flaming tongue, sort of the idea of destruction and dissolution. The figure of Kala that resided above the temple doorways in Java now is firmly ensconced behind Ganesh. So that this idea of Ganesh, the idea of abundance and fertility and creativity, is juxtaposed with this other equally powerful image and idea of destruction and the power of dissolution. And so these two parts are no longer seen as one becoming the other, that in fact they are two sides equal of strength and design. The temples of East Java in the Majapai Kingdom were much smaller, more modest, than the temples we find in Central Java's Mataram Kingdom. But we do find also a shift toward narration. There's a great deal of emphasis on telling stories. And you can see here, this, this temple has been badly damaged uh, above its lowest level. But there is intact a very interesting relief carving that extends around the base that would have been visible to anyone standing near its sides. The carvings here are done in a very interesting style. We call this the Wyong style because it's very similar to kind of painting we see in Bali. One of the things that's remarkable about this carving style, see how shallow it is and how the figures stand and move like they're flattened out against the surface, almost like Egyptian hieroglyphs. The surface is also richly ornate. We see this sort of jungle growth <clears throat> and trees and animals that fill up every available space. Also notice that behind the figure on the right is two smaller dwarfish figures who unmistakably represent the Punakawan. 
So here we are in Chinese Surawana, mid 14th century, and we begin to see the same sort of visual elements that we find in the arts of Bali. When we look at the temple carvings uh, along the base, we come down on a plan view, we'll see that not a one story is told on its walls, but three. Arjuna Iwaha, Sri Tanjung, and in one corner, in the north, is a Bubuksa and Gagak Aking. All right. So, when people began to study this temple, they were confused that the stories were all sort of jumbled up, and they thought perhaps People had forgotten how to tell these stories. But if you really look closely at them, it's not that they have forgotten the sequence of the stories, but the purpose of the stories had taken on new significance. If you look at the stories thematically, you'll notice that all the story images on the north side of the temple are images of taken from outdoor scenes, and all of the images that appear on the southern part of the temple are all palace scenes that deal with interiors. Another interesting thematic idea emerges with this temple, and that is the images of the stories that deal with different themes, such as world renouncer. These would be stories where the characters are giving up or surrendering parts of their worldly existence for spiritual gains. Or world maintainer, that people are finding ways to maintain and hold on to the things that they value. Or world destroyer, these are stories of battle and destruction and the overthrow of kingdoms. So it's interesting that these themes emerge in these temples, and it's possible that the way this is meant to be read is that it was seen that people looking at these stories and wanting to convey certain ideas would go to certain parts of the temples. Take for example, we know from history that the kings arrived at these temples and that offerings would be made. And while they were there, they would read stories from the temples. Now, if the king should arrive and he wants to tell his people that a war is coming, he would stand in the place where he could tell and point to parts of this temple or told stories of the world destruction. In this way, he could begin to introduce ideas through a story rather than talk about them directly. This kind of strategy is found in the puppet theater and in other storytelling traditions in Java and Bali today. And so this sort of indirect way of using stories as a way of kind of communicating political ideas and social messages. Let's compare the Wayang relief starry at Chandi Surawana in the Majapahit Kingdom with the Ramayana in Prambanan in Mataram Kingdom. Notice how much more fully rounded and naturalistic the gestures and actions are in the Ramayana relief. There's a, a sense of actually seeing a kind of scene played out by characters or actors in a play. Whereas here, the flatness makes it seem more like a, a painting that has been made into relief. It's very shallow, it's very surface oriented, and the, the characters feel sort of flattened out in a schematic way so that their essential gestures and actions can be easily read. Not all sculptures that appeared in the Majapai period were flattened sculptures. Many of them were powerfully dramatic, like this image of the King Alanga as the god Vishnu riding Garuda. This scene, we see him calm and passive, wielding his chakra and his conch, 
and sitting beneath this massive Garuda looks terrifyingly powerful, and he has in his claws these writhing snakes. And so here we see the king of Arlanga, this famous king, and he shows his power not by exhibiting power, not by presenting himself as an image of power himself, but that he is a figure who is calm and impassive and through his passivity controls these massive forces, forces of nature. The idea of seeing Vishnu astride Garuda is an image that has become very popular and can be found in this Balinese wood carving that is of contemporary design. Another important idea in the Majapai Kingdom was Buddhism, a kind of mystical Buddhism. This is an exquisite sculpture of Prajnaparamita, which is the goddess of divine spiritual knowledge. This was found in East Java. Many people believe the extraordinary beauty of this statue refers to an actual person who lived at this time, Queen Kendides of the Singosari Kingdom. There's no exact knowledge whether this is in fact true or whether this idea of a king or queen being represented as a deity is something that was widely practiced at this time. Here, Prajnaparamita is doing the Dharma Chakra Mudra, which is like a Buddha doing a teaching. She is giving us this access to knowledge. You see the lotus that curls out from underneath her arm, holds at its top a Lontar book. The Mojapai kingdom would come under attack from outside and from within, and eventually the remains of the kingdom would scatter. Up in the mountains of Java, a, the last temple built by the Mojapai kingdom is Chandisukho. In this temple, we see uh, a changing emphasis away from established order and known truths toward a more kind of local gods and deities and mystical knowledge that has to do with the kind of magical practices of old Javanese religions. Here we see an uh, image of Garuda done in the Wayang style. Other images at Chandisukho that evoke this magical ideas are the relief carvings of Sadewa tied to the Kapok tree, threatened by Durga. Durga is the wife of Shiva, and here she is transformed into her monstrous aspect of death and destruction, and she threatens Sadewa, the youngest of the Pandawa heroes, who is tied to the Kapok tree, which is a tree that grows alongside graves, graveyards, and is here, he's in a sense, in a haunted world, and he's surrounded by ghosts that drift in and out of the shadows. Durga, behind Durga, are two of her witch consorts that are there to help her in her evil deeds. Durga is very similar in this case to the queen of black magic in Bali, Rangda, and bears this idea of a cursed person who is outside society and threatening the social order. Another powerful relief carving that we can see from Chandi Sukho is Bhima holding his Chris dagger. He is lifting this giant up into the air and stabbing him with this special magical weapon, the Chris dagger. We'll talk more about the significance of this dagger. For now, note its unique shape, that unlike most daggers that have a hilt that is straight into a blade, the Chris dagger is bent down in like a pistol grip. Notice behind Bhima, he also has, again, a trusty servant there to help him on his journey. 
If we compare the statue in Chandi Sukho with contemporary Balinese shadow puppets, you can see the shape and design of the figure is quite similar. The Bhima from the Mojapayat kingdom is very similar to the way Bhima appears in Bali today. What's interesting to note, though, is that if we look at the shadow puppets of Java today, we'll see they do not resemble the Mojapayat kingdom designs or those of Bali, but they are quite different. And that is the question I must leave you with. What happened to the design of the shadow puppets in Java would, that would so change their shape and form from the traditions of Mojapayat in the past.